Glory to God. Hallelujah. I've entitled this today, This Changes Everything. And we sang the song, Amazing Love. <laughs> this changes everything. And we know the scripture, most probably one of the most famous scriptures that most of the world seems to know is, for God so loved the world. Isn't that right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. This changes everything. Praise God. I'm reminded of a story I heard about um, um, World War II had ended, and uh, um, a particular gentleman, um, let me just read the story so I don't mess it up. <laughs> It says, after World War II, the United States had sent finances to Europe for the care of orphans. A story was told of a man who brought his young daughter to an orphanage and in an attempt to drop her off, explained that he was too old and frail to work and feed them both, that she would starve and die. He was told that there are strict guidelines for receiving children. They must not have a living parent. The elderly gentleman handed them his daughter and said, if that be true, then it can be arranged. He then left the orphanage and hung himself to save his daughter's life. And uh, this um, apparently true story is, is a great analogy of, of course, uh, God rescuing us. What the cost was, he had to become man, that he had to give his life, that he took our place and suffered the full penalty of our sin. So again, I will say that God's love changes everything. And this is not my message, but a side note is God's love in us is the force, is the potential for us to make the changes and difference in this world that need to be made. I'll say that again, that God's love in us has the potential to change this world more than anything else. Amen. So what, what we see released and we hear celebrating uh, this resurrection of Jesus Christ, we see how it affected and split uh, the human race in time was split. Uh, we have uh, before he died and we have after he died. But literally, I believe throughout eternity, we will look back to this most significant event for humanity. This is it. This changes everything. And so Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39. In Matthew 26, 39, it says, and going a little farther, he threw himself upon the ground on his face and praying, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, not what I desire, but as you will and desire. We know the King James says, not my will, but thine be done. His will, Jesus' will, uh, his will means exactly that, his desire. Uh, Jesus uh, desired uh, to not do this, uh, but he was saying, not my desire, Father, your desire, your will be done. And we see here that literally that Jesus had a will and the Father had a will. Now, this is a very difficult thing to get our head around because we know that there is one God who manifests himself in three persons. And so we know that uh, Father is God. We know Holy Spirit is God, and we know Jesus is God. We know this because the scriptures concur that Jesus was Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. 
And so, so we know that they are God. We know this, uh, that, that Jesus uh, is speaking to the Father and he's communicating with the Father and he's wrestling with the will of the Father because his will does not want, listen, Jesus was not considering the, the, uh, what would have been called the flagellum. We'll get into that here in a little bit. He wasn't considering the, the shame of the cross. He wasn't considering uh, that he would be beaten uh, beyond recognition. He wasn't considering that in the garden when he sweat as it were great drops of blood. The reason why he sweat blood out of the pores of his skin, which represents extreme anxiety. Listen, if you have had anxiety, if you have had pressure, if you have had thoughts, if you have had things come against you, Jesus did that for you. So you don't have to have them. You don't have to be worried about it. You don't have to be concerned. Jesus took the extreme anxiety. Listen, it even happens today. It isn't just Jesus that had that experience. People who are worrying and full of stress have had blood literally come out of the pores of their skin. It is an actual medical thing that happens. So Jesus is not going through this because, oh, they're going to beat me and I don't want to be beaten. It was, no, I have never been separated from the bright presence of my Father. If there is any other way to do this. The cup, he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What is the cup? The cup is him drinking uh, the dregs of death's bitter cup. He took into himself our sin. He took into himself our iniquity. He took into himself all of our wrong, all of our failures, all of our past, everything that you were before you got born again. He took it all into himself. And in the garden, which is, you know, the Garden of Gethsemane, which is the press. Jesus really, literally won the victory there and then walked it out. Because when he said, not my will, he set his face. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In the John 3.16, in the Amplified Bible, the classic, it says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son, so that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him, shall not perish, come to destruction, or be lost but have eternal, everlasting life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In Hebrews chapter two and verse 18, this is the new living. It says, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. So Jesus, uh, it's not like he doesn't know what it's like to suffer. Literally, it says that Jesus uh, was tempted in every way. We dismiss that like, well, you know, but he was Jesus. He was God. No, literally, in every way. And you're trying to even imagine Jesus, uh, you know, uh, having any thoughts about, um, like, say, a woman, for instance, you know, like, ooh, man, she got a nice butt. Ooh-wee. But it says he was tempted in every way. Without sin. So, you know, the devil was running them by him just like he does others, right? And the devil runs them by us. Gentlemen, I know you know it is true. But Jesus overcame the world. Therefore, you are able to overcome the world. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, this is not my message, but I just feel like I need to go down this trail just for a second. Jesus overcame the world. You overcome the world. That means you don't have to sin. This is a lie that Christians have bought into 
that you have to sin. Everybody sins. It's like we have an obligation to sin. It is not true. You can go months without sinning. Did you know that? I just, I'm just offering that to you today. Jesus literally went into the lower regions of the world. He conquered hell and death, rose from the dead, not so you could continue in sin. See, I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to do this. It is the eight o'clock service. It's Easter and we're supposed to just do happy stuff, right? But listen, freedom from sin is happy stuff. You have been freed from the tyranny of Satan and his controls. I have no obligation to sin. We are the circumcision. Woof. What does that mean? Well, y'all know what that means. Circumcision. It's a cutting away of the flesh. Uh, when you cut away the flesh, what does it do? It dies. I have died and my life is hidden, is hidden, is hidden, is hidden with Christ in God. Sin has no more control over me. And people will lean back on, you know, I'm just a sinner, see, by grace. Like we're just dragging along, barely making it. No, 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 no. God is your father. The greater one's inside of you. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you and quickens your mortal body. If you've been quickened, that means that sin's effect has been annulled, has been done away with. And all of its factions, its ability to control you and make you do stuff has been ended. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't need to smoke a joint every morning anymore. I don't need to chase all the girls anymore. It's hard enough to chase the one I got. <laughs> Just keeping up with that is enough. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, I enjoy chasing that. I just want you to know. I just love it. I love it. She's like, How do I do this? She's like, oh, stop. You know, anyway. <laughs> Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> That's a whole nother trail itself. <laughs> Stay with <me>. Love you, baby. <laughs> glory to God. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory to Jesus. Sorry. Okay, back to it. All right. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let me say this. So Jesus, in the garden, uh, wins... Uh, the victory of his own soul and own will, and then sets his face towards the cross. And we know uh, the details are gruesome. The, 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 uh, the things that took place uh, that, you know, uh, they, first of all, they come at him. You know, the devil was afraid of Jesus. The Sanhedrin was afraid of Jesus. So he and his uh, disciples, you know, there's 12, uh, they're in the garden praying as they would because Judas knew where to find them. This was not a new thing, by the way, them praying in the garden. But this was special. This was Jesus dealing with what he is about to do. They sent 300 soldiers. 300. If you have ever been to the Mount of Olives, it's not that big. And there's, there's not that many trees. There's not a lot of olive trees in there. Some of them, olive trees have been there since Jesus was in, under them. It's amazing. And so Jesus is there praying 300 soldiers and the officers, the scripture says. You know what that means? The police officers of the Sanhedrin. What are they afraid of? Well, Jesus has slipped through their company many times. They tried to get him and, and seize him, and he would just like <whistles> walk through the midst of them. 
They thought, we're not going to let him get away. 300 soldiers. You know the story, Jesus, uh, that, that uh, uh, Judas comes up and, and kisses Jesus on the cheek as a signification of who he was. And Jesus, you know, says, you, you betray me with a kiss. They're like, who are you looking for? <laughs> We're looking for Jesus. <laughs> Jesus says, I am he. Man, swords and shields and clanking helmets. <laughs> you know, 300 soldiers and however many officers, police officers, they're all falling on their backside. There is not enough humans on the earth to take Jesus against his will. And Jesus said, no one takes my life. I lay it down. Jesus said, you know, am I supposed to stop at this hour? He said, no, it's for this hour that I, was, I came into the world. So Jesus uh, yields to them. We know the story. Peter comes out and just rips off one of their ears, you know. Jesus slaps it back on his head. <laughs> I mean, there's some crazy stuff going on. Did you know we only have a very small portion of the miracles that Jesus did in his life? It is said in the word that if, if they were to write of all of them, the world could not contain the books. So we only have a small portion of the miracles that Jesus performed. And so here's one more. Just, just before he goes out, he slaps somebody's ear back on the side of their head. You know, I, I like Peter, though. I, I, I don't know why I like Peter. It just, it makes me feel better about myself, that's all. <laughs> I could just see myself, oh, oh, oh you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Jesus said, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. Put the ear back on the guy's head. And you know, that guy had some stuff to talk about for the rest of his life. I kid you not, it was off. I kid you not, it was on the ground. This dude, Jesus, pulls it up, doesn't even clean it off. <laughs> Pops me upside my head, and the thing's gone. No bleeding, nothing. I'm done, I'm done, you know. Quit drinking. Man. And this all surrounding the great event. And we know that the, the soldiers abused him. The soldiers, um, they, were, they were abusing him even before Pontius Pilate declared that he would be scourged. That they slapped him. And he's questioning them, why do you slap me? You know, for what? They were just abusive. Now, Jesus didn't do this for himself. He did this for me, subjecting himself to me. Wow. If you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ, you know, a, a movie made by Mel Gibson, it's one of the most tremendous depictions of the crucifixion that you could ever watch. Uh, it, it isn't even as far as it actually went, just so you know. People say, oh, it's just too graphic. Well, they dialed it back so that you could watch it. And so the soldiers abused him, uh, the Sanhedrin abused him, turned him over to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate's conversation with Jesus was, don't you know that I have the power? Jesus didn't say much, but he did talk to him about what he just said. He said, you would have no power except that which God. And Jesus just messed up Pontius Pilate. He's like, oh, oh, oh. His wife is saying, don't mess with Jesus. You better not mess with Jesus. So he's caught between pleasing the masses. He's fighting his own conscience. He knows this is an innocent man. Y'all with me? So he's trying to appease them by having him beaten. 
And literally the beating that Jesus received. Now this is, this is actually after they've already punched him in the face. They've blindfolded him. They've done all kinds of stuff. Now they're going to scourge him with what's called flagulum. We, we often talk call it a cat of nine tails, but cat of nine tails wasn't until the 1500s, actually. It was something uh, that was like, you know, bad person, bad person, but flagulum was definitely torture. And they took strips of leather and tied it to um, a wooden handle of which the soldiers, now these are soldiers, the soldiers were big dudes, you know. You couldn't be Pee Wee Herman and be a soldier, You had to be strong. You had to be able to carry the weight of the, the mail that was on them for protection. The sword itself was heavy. The shield was heavy. All of this armor. So these are big dudes. These are the ones that were actually beating Jesus. A right-handed one, a left-handed one. There were two different uh, flagulum, a left-handed, a right-handed, so that they could uh, get, they would not get as worn out. They would take turns so they don't get worn out. We're talking about 39 lashes, 40 save one. And each one of these pieces of leather had a ball of lead tied into the end of it. Much of it would have pottery or glass or, or, or steel in, in the lead itself so that when the, these balls would hit the flesh, it would explode. And then some would stick into the body and they would pull the flesh away. Jesus subjected himself to this physical torture so that we could be healed. 39 times it was said to me by a nurse and later an insurance person of all people. It was later said to me that there are 39 different categories of sickness disease. What a coincidence. I didn't care whether it was or wasn't. We know that everything is taken care of by his stripes. But it was funny because the, the nurse was earlier in the years, I used to talk about this in our uh, uh, membership class when talking about the Lord's Supper and, and communicating about the Lord's Supper. I would talk about this dynamic of Jesus' crucifixion of which we should consider every time we go to the communion table. It wasn't an Indiana Jones whip and put little stripes on his back. It removed the flesh from his body. Do y'all understand this? In so much, the scriptures say, uh, prophetically in the Old Testament, it says, all of my bones were exposed. All of his bones. That means you could see his ribs. He, you could see his femurs, all the different things, you know, right? And when, they, when it, the flesh was gone here, they shoot for another place. Listen, they hit his face, his shoulders, his biceps, his triceps, his glutes, his calves. He was bludgeoned. The scriptures tell us that his visage or his image was so marred, you could not recognize him. And they would explode his flesh. they pull it across like a plow through a field, peeling the flesh from his bones. And these soldiers were surgeons. They knew how to keep a person alive. You would think this would cause his death. Because if they hit a major ar artery, he would bleed out. But listen, he did bleed because he was so exhausted when they put that, that cross beam across his open flesh. Listen, this is all the nerve endings are out open. They stick that thing on him. He's still bleeding. It's no wonder that he fell. It's no wonder that he was exhausted. He didn't have much blood left in his body. Yeah. Y'all with me? We know that the man helped and picked it up. Can you imagine being that man? This, this beam has his blood on it. Redemption is dripping down over you. The most precious and most valuable blood of Jesus Christ. Woo! And they take him up to, to Golgotha. They take him up to the place of the skull. I've been there. It actually, when I was there in 2014, still looked like a skull. You look at the side of the mountain, you're like, oh my goodness. Here it is. And we sing this song, and it sounds so poetic, you know. 
on a hill far away lies an old rugged rock. <laughs> but man, the tragedy of the cross was our victory. And when Jesus, they pulled him apart to put him on that cross, they literally threw him down and again on that open flesh on the ground. And they pulled his shoulders out of socket and nailed them, his hands. And they raised him up. Nailed his feet. And apparently you're, you're unable in this, in this condition to breathe. You're not able to exhale is what I understand. And uh, so they have pulled his shoulders out of socket. And, and so he has the pain of hanging from his, his uh, wrists or hands. You know, who knows? They go back and forth on that one. But he, he's hanging there, and he has to push up on that one nail that's in through his feet in order to exhale and then hang from the other because it's less pain. This is, the Roman soldiers were brutal. This is what redemption cost. This is what he did. I tell you what, you meditate on this, you feel like, you know what? I am not going to let the devil put none of this junk on me. Jesus paid too great a price. Why should he bear it and then me bear it anyway? Think about the extent that he, the love that he had for us to take him to this degree. You are not a punk. The devil is a punk. You are not an afterthought. You are not a stepchild. You are not even a grandchild. He just has children. Your value was raised to the heavens when Jesus sat down. So they raise him up and they drop that thing. And Jesus hangs there. He said, Father, forgive them. He's talking about you and me. Father, forgive them. He wasn't just talking about them. He's talking about you. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Whew. And at that last moment, God poured our sins into Jesus. Now, I want you to understand that Jesus always talked to his father when he prayed, and he said, Father, I thank you that you hear my prayers. It was always Father. But at that moment, when sin was poured into him, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it was for that moment that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. It was the anxiety of being separated from the bright presence of the Father. The scriptures tell us that the Father turned his face from his Son. Why? Because he had become us on the cross. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. His death was our death. His suffering was for you, and was for me, but I want you to know that he did not spend one second extra in that horrible place. Hallelujah. 
at that right moment when all sin was paid for, God sent life down into that horrible place. Ephesians says that he stripped off principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Whew. I want to see a video of that moment. When I get to heaven, I'm going to say, hey, where's the video department? <laughs> I want to see what that looked like. Praise God. And we celebrate the victory of Jesus Christ. Because if you are in Jesus Christ, you were with him when he rose. You were with him on the cross. You were with him in that suffering. You were with him when he rose. And you are with him now, seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places. It says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, this changes everything. Now, listen. It's interesting because Jesus, speaking of this, he was talking about a seed. When it goes, it has to die in order for it to produce, and it produces much fruit, right? Yep. And he said, now is the spirit of this world cast out. Now. When? When life went into hell and stripped off principalities and powers, that was when Satan was judged. We are not waiting for his judgment. He has already been judged. Do you understand? We execute that judgment. Y'all with me? He sat down at the right hand of the Father until his enemies be made his footstool. And he has given all this authority to us. He's been given all the authority. Now we have the authority. Y'all with me? So Jesus paid too great a price for us to be down here thinking the devil's in charge. He said, now is the spirit of this world cast out. When? In that event. He just is deceiving people. He walks about as a roaring lion. He acts like one. Roar! That's it. Jesus pulled his teeth. Yep. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So Jesus' victory, we celebrate it today. We celebrate it every day. We walk in it and act on it and live in it, overcoming the evil one, overcoming sin, overcoming limitations, overcoming our past. This changes everything. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace resting upon your people today. Thank you for working in each and every one of us, Lord God, uh, causing us to realize, <laughs> just revealing to us, Lord, the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. We thank you, Lord God, for strengthening us with mighty power by your spirit in our inner man. Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith. And the power of the resurrection to be evident everywhere we go. Hallelujah. Salvation and redemption dwell in us. We thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. With every head bowed and every eye closed, please, no one looking around the room. If you've come here today, it's quite possible, or you've tuned in to our broadcasts, it's possible you don't know for sure if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. The Bible says you can know for sure there is a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid. Hell is a horrible place of torment and torture. It is an eternal place. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. If you leave this body and go into eternity without Jesus, that is the place. That is the place you will go. But Jesus went there for you. Jesus paid the price for you so that through faith in him, you could escape that just punishment. Jesus took that punishment for you 
And all that you have to do in order to escape that punishment is to ask Jesus Christ into your heart and make him your Lord and Savior. God didn't make it hard for us. Jesus did all the work. Salvation is a free gift. It's free to us, but it wasn't free. It cost Jesus his life. So it ends up being the most expensive commodity that there is. Most valuable and precious commodity cost Jesus his life. He is the most precious and the most valuable. He wants to give you his life. So today, if you'll pray this simple prayer with me from your heart, you can know if you were to die, you would go to heaven. Will you pray with me today? Say this from your heart. Everybody together say, dear God, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for me, and he was buried, and he rose again. I call Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for saving me. Thank you, Father, that I've been born again. In Jesus' name, amen you've tuned in today and you've gotten away from the Lord, um, it's, it's, you know, not hard to come home. You know, we hear the prodigal son story that, uh, you know, one of, the, one of his sons uh, took all of his inheritance and spent it all on riotous living and decided he would come home and the father ran to him. And we know that this is how our God is, how our father is. If you've gone away from the Lord today, if you need to come home, we want to pray with you as well. In uh, 1 John 1, 9, it says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If that's you and you're in that condition, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me right now. Just close your eyes and say this from your heart, everybody. Just say, Father, I have messed up. I've made some mistakes. I've gone the wrong way, but I'm coming home today. I ask you now to forgive me of all of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your cleansing. In Jesus' name, amen.